Good morning. We welcome you to our continuing study of questions that you have asked. Uh, as we begin our lesson today, Brother Billy Mormon is going to lead us in number 300. Number 300. class where we are studying about Bible questions that you have asked. You'll see on the screen the theme, Victorious Through Christ. This is our theme for 2019. It's taken from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I just wanted to brag on you because you're starting out the year with the first opportunity we've had for Sunday morning Bible school, and you're here. That's a great way to start out, trying to have victory through Jesus Christ. We uh, have several on our sick list. We have the standard ones that uh, we've been praying for for a long time. Uh, Craig Glenn is still recovering at home. Uh, we've, we've got uh, Paula Warner, June Cupper, Nina Morrison, uh, I know uh, Brother Eddie Allen in a few days is going to be having uh, hip surgery, we need to keep remembering him. Our uh, sister Bonnie Warner has been uh, diagnosed with a slow-growing cancer, and uh, she's going to have surgery in the spring. We need to remember her in our prayers. Uh, Dolores Coates fell, and 
uh, broke some ribs. She is recuperating at home. We need to keep remembering Dolores in our prayers. Are there others that we need to remember this morning? Hayden Penna has RSV. You know, it's just, I've heard more about RSV this winter than I've heard, I guess, any winter in my lifetime. It just seems to be pretty prevalent in the area. Remember that uh, on Tuesday, there's a Golden Circle Luncheon. Uh, the program this coming Tuesday is going to be to review the plans for the Golden Circle for the year. And so... I hope that if you're in that uh, age group that you'll plan on being with us in the annex. We don't know yet when the annex is going to shut down. We do have meetings with contractors on Monday, but for right now we're able to use the annex on Tuesday. Would you bow with me, please? Our loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for how good you are to us. We... Uh, we love you, Father. We're so thankful for your willing to sacrifice your son for our salvation. And we pray that as we go through this year, we will learn more about how to be victorious through your son. Father, we have many that are on our sick list. We pray that you would be with Craig Glenn, Paula Warner, June Cupper, Nina Morrison, uh, Hayden. Henna, uh, we pray that uh, you'd be with Bonnie Warner and Dolores Coates, and, and we pray that you'd help Brother Eddie Allen's uh, upcoming surgery to be successful. We ask your blessings to be with us in this class today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you in class. I know Janita and I are excited today to have two of our granddaughters Natalie and Reagan Estes here from Germantown. Uh, I'm particularly honored because they, instead of going to their regular class, they said, I want to hear you in your class today. So we're talking about pressure. Whew. You know, uh, we are studying about what does the Bible say about various questions. And back at the beginning of 2018, many of you submitted questions uh, it's very similar to the, the question today is very similar to one that I uh, preached a sermon on here several years ago, and that question is, are there saved people in other churches? The real focus is, are we saved? As we look at unlocking the truth today, <clears throat> and you look at the lesson, the question for today that was submitted is, why do others say that the Church of Christ teaches that they are the only ones going to heaven? Uh, have any of you, just see by show of hands, have any of you ever heard somebody ask that question? A lot of you have, okay? So this is not, this question would not surprise you, okay? Uh, some, I'm afraid, might even be... Uh, or find this topic offensive. I think most of us have loved ones that are in other religious groups. Some may even have family members that are in other religious groups. And the question itself sort of implies, well, you folks think you've got it made. Well, I, the objectives that I've got for this lesson today it's not important what my opinion is. You know, what we need to do is go back to the Bible and see what God says on both of these questions. And really, I think we're dealing with a singular topic. And that topic is the uniqueness of the Lord's church. I remember when we went up on that... Uh, trip to, to visit the Ark in Kentucky and, and went on to uh, go to the Creation Museum, that while we were there, we also went to Cane Ridge Meeting House. And that's where Barton W. Stone and 
I think it was four or five other Presbyterian preachers took a stand. They were very concerned about what they were being told they could or could not do by a group of men as opposed to what the Bible said. And they wrote what is called the Last Will and Testament of the Springfield Presbytery. In essence, they said this creed that we've been living under, we're, we're going to bury it. And what we're going to do is we're just going to go back to the Bible and do what the Bible says. You know, that, that's got a very uh, comforting ring to it because we know that people who do what the Bible says to become Christians will be Christians. And, and we know that people who do what the Bible says in what they're, and how they worship God will be pleasing to God. And we know that people who live as the Bible teaches them to live uh, will be in good stead when they face God in judgment. You know, when you think about it, you can ask the question, how many churches did Jesus say he would build? How many? One. Matthew 16, 18, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I call your attention to the my church. That's a a reference that, is sing that uses a singular pronoun. Did, did, he, did Jesus ever state that it was important that we follow his teaching? Uh, this is a redundant kind of question because there are several places that he did. In John the 14th chapter in verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Later in that same chapter, in verse 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Over in the next chapter, in verse, chapter 15, verse 10, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. In the 14th verse of chapter 15, You are my friends, this is Jesus talking, if you do whatever I command you. In uh, Jesus, in Matthew the 7th chapter, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount, and part that, if you've been to Vacation Bible School very much, you've, you've probably sung, sung songs about this. You know, wise man built his house upon the rock. This is, this is the references here. Therefore, whoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And then he goes to the other extreme. He says in verse, verses 26 and 27, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You know, <clears throat> I think from looking at these verses, we can see that it is important how we respond to the teachings of Christ. You know, this, and the, the question that a lot of people struggle with is, is the spirit of what Jesus taught his love letter? Are we responding to a love letter when we look at how we're obedient to Jesus, or are, do we need to respond in detail to what Jesus taught? Or do we need to respond both in spirit as well as in specifics? Well, I think Jesus answered that in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. When he said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is likened to it. 
Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So certainly, the Christian needs to be permeated by the love of Jesus Christ. You'll remember when we were studying from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, when we were studying about miracles and tongues, all the times that uh, Paul talked about, if I have these kinds of miracles and have not love, I am nothing. But Jesus, you know, also said in John, the 12th chapter, in verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So I think the answer to that question is that we ought to be following both the spirit and the details of Jesus' teaching. You know, the church in Ephesus was practicing practicing the acts of Christianity. When we read their letter in Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7, but the message to them was that they had lost their first love and they were told to repent or that Christ would remove their candlestick. So if you look at the context of that, they were following the teachings, you know, they, I bet when they came to church, they had five acts of worship that they, they participated in. And you, they, they probably, uh, when you looked at their behavior towards one another, they were probably, uh, well, they were doing what their teaching had told them, but they were missing something. And what were they missing? They were missing love. So you can't take one or the other. You've got to have both of them. Did Jesus ever address the issue of people who claim to be his followers, but were in error in what they were doing. Or in other words, the question I'm asking here is being sincere enough to save you. Well, in Matthew the seventh chapter, back to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Are we back on now? Okay, thank you. This is Jesus giving a, forte, a forecast of how things are going to be at Judgment Day. And, and you know, if you've got people that are calling Jesus Lord, what would they be calling themselves? Christians, that's right. If they, you know. So at Judgment Day, you've got people who are calling themselves Christians. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? So not only are they calling themselves Christians and calling Jesus Lord, they're doing various religious things. And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. 
ye that work iniquity. So, you know, if we go all the way back to that question of do we need to just be sincere and, and love Jesus, here he's pointing out it's more than just calling me Lord, it's following what I say. Now, did the Holy Spirit know that there would be splits and differences in the so-called Christian world? Once again, I'd say yes, because if you look at what Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, which I think we're in now, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now you probably know of religious groups um, that teach or have in the past taught those kinds of things. I can remember probably my first religious protest. It was when I was in high school. And I don't know how it was when you were in high school, but back then we always had fish on Friday. We had fish on Friday because there was a certain religious group that insisted that their members not eat anything, any meat unless it was fish on Friday. Uh, I was able to be successful in getting our lunchroom to start offering something other than free fish on Friday. We know that there are religious groups that have uh, forbid marrying for some of their religious leaders. So what the Holy Spirit said talked about deviations that were going to happen in the future and we can look around us and see those kinds of deviations happening. In 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, Timothy was told, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Peter said, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even evil spoken of. It's just like... Paul, when he was talking to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, and he told them that from within your ranks, there, there is, you're going to have to watch out about false teachers. You know, it's, it, sometimes it's easy to identify a false teacher if they go around with a label out in front of them that's something different than what's in the Bible. What is really dangerous is when you get false teaching that is within the confines of a congregation. And there are warnings here about that. So what does all this mean? You know, understanding and following God's Word is essential to our eternal salvation. You know, I think we ought to learn from the Old Testament examples. You know, repeatedly, God told people that if they would follow His instructions, they'd be blessed. I'm talking about examples in the Old Testament. And repeatedly, God warned His people when they were not following His instructions, and consistently, those who did not obey had to face the consequences. Can you think of any time in the Old Testament where God's people had to face the consequences for not following Him? Give me one example. The flood, a great example, you know. Uh, the Bible tells us that even the thoughts and intents of their hearts were evil, and here you've got eight people who were saved, and, you know, if you were in 
uh, Brother Farr's Genesis class when he was talking about that and he did some extrapolations of how many people were lost in the flood. It's a huge number that could have been lost in the flood. Over a billion people could have been lost in the flood because they turned away from God. When I think about the Israelites, can you think of the Israelites ever being punished for not following God? A lot of times. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Ultimately, uh, you got one group of them going into Assyrian captivity, another group of them going into Babylonian captivity. Uh, they, they had times when he chastised them, trying to get them to turn back. You remember when he had all the snakes in the camp and people were dying from snake bite? Over and over we can see that. The Bible tells us what we need to do to be saved. The Bible shows us in a multitude of places, people following these same instructions to become Christians. I know we interact with a lot of people um, who are not New Testament Christians in the jail ministry and in those that we teach when they come for help with food or clothing. Uh, and sometimes, when you know, when we don't have very much time to talking to an individual, we, we might suggest to them, why don't you just read the book of Acts and see what people did to become Christians in New Testament times. If you'll do the same thing, the Lord will add you to His church. The Bible tells us how to worship, and it gives us examples of Christians engaged in worship. And if, if it was acceptable to God then, if we'll do the same thing, it'll be acceptable to Him today. The Bible tells us how to live as Christians and what to avoid if we are to remain Christians. When thinking about how to live, you know, you think about the fruit of the Spirit that you see in Galatians, the fifth chapter, or the Christian graces that you see in 2 Peter, the first chapter. Those are good headlines on how to live. If you want to think about what to leave behind, look at the works of the flesh there in Galatians, the fifth chapter. You know, the Bible tells us what should be our priority. Matthew 6, what does it say put first? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, okay? And all these things will be added unto you. And he gives us a picture of expected responses to people in need. What did he say to do to people with, that were hungry and people that were thirsty? People that were naked, people that were sick and in prison, visit them. I mean, you know, it doesn't take somebody that has a huge IQ to understand what the Bible says. So why do we have this? Why do we have all of these kinds of instructions? Well, Paul told Timothy that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now consider this, not only did Jesus say he would build his church, Matthew 16, 18, he also prayed for unity of his believers. This was that great prayer in John the 17th chapter at the end of his ministry. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So based on what we've just been reading from the Bible, is denominationalism what Jesus came to earth to establish? You know, we have religious groups all over this county wearing different religious names. Some, of the, some are biblical, but most are not. I think most of them teach the same thing about moral living. And most teach and practice that it's right to help others. But there is different teaching about the ways to be saved. There's different teaching about what are the ways to worship. And... The warnings about continuing in sin after becoming a Christian are different. You know, one of the first questions you asked was, what about this doctrine of once saved, always saved? And we went into detail about what the Bible says on that. 
And yet, many religious groups in this county teach something different than that. Well, do any of these differences in religious groups who call themselves Christians in the broadest sense, do any of that make a difference? Well, following what God said mattered in some other examples. It mattered for Adam and Eve. It mattered for all of those who were lost in the flood. It mattered for Nadab and Abihu when they offered strange fire. What was their future? He got burned up. God sent fire out from the altar and consumed them. For Achan when the, and the battle of Jericho. For Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit about what they were giving. For the church in Laodicea who felt really good about themselves, but Jesus said they were what? Neither cold nor hot. They were lukewarm. All right? So in the midst of all these differences and all this religious confusion, what can we do? Well, I think what we can do is go back to the Bible as our one source of authority in religious matters. The outcome for those who did this in the first century was a wonderful outcome. Revelation 2.10 said that God was going to give them a crown of life. So the logical conclusion is that if we will follow the same instructions given to the first century Christians, we should have the same outcome. And so why risk being lost? The first century Christians believed and repented and confessed Christ and were baptized for the remission of their sins in response to the gospel. That's why you will hear the same thing taught at the Boonville Church of Christ. And to do anything less, like the sinner's prayer, or anything more, like voting on membership, is spiritually dangerous. The first century Christians obeyed the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 7. That's why you're going to hear that taught and practiced here at the Boonville Church of Christ, to observe the Lord's Supper on a different frequency, is without spiritual authority. The first century Christians baptized believers in water by burying them in water. That's why you will hear the same thing taught and practiced at the Boonville Church of Christ. To baptize by sprinkling or pouring is without scriptural authority. Church government in the first century was by a plurality of elders in each congregation, and that's why you will hear the same thing taught and practiced at the Boonville Church of Christ, to be led by a preacher or so-called pastor or to have centralized direction from anyone or a conference other than Christ is without spiritual authority. Congregational singing that we studied about in one of our questions in worship in the first century was without accompaniment of instrumental music. And that's why you're going to hear the same thing taught and practiced at the Boonville Church of Christ. To revert back to Jewish practices like instrumental music is without New Testament authority. Well, who is to say if a person is saved or lost? Well... Jesus makes the decision about who is added to the church. You, if you go and you look at Peter's preaching there on the day, to, day of Pentecost, and when they cried out to him about what they needed to do, he told them to repent and be baptized there in Acts uh, 2 and verse 38. We know that, and we don't know how big the crowd was. It was a huge crowd, though. There were a million, over a million people that came into Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, but 3,000 obeyed what Peter had instructed them. And there in Acts 2 and verse 47, we know that the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. So the Lord adds people to the church that are doing what he says they need to do to be saved. We can certainly see what the people did in Acts 2 
And if we follow their example, Jesus is going to add us to his church as well. And Jesus makes the decision on who is removed from his church. In the seven letters to the churches in Asia, in Revelation 2 and verse, or Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3, two of those seven congregations were warned about Christ having the power to remove them from the book of life. There in Revelation 2 and verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, or do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove the candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And to the church in Laodicea, he told them if they didn't repent, he was going to spew them or vomit them out of his mouth. The fact is that Jesus is the judge. In Acts 10 and verse 42, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. That's talking about Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So what does this mean for us? Well, I think what it means is, let's study to understand God's Word. Let's have the integrity to obey what God's Word says and let's do all we can to teach others His Word. Let's demonstrate our love for God and our love for our neighbors in our actions, and let's be the, quote, Church of Christ, unquote, in our teaching, in our practice, as well as in our attitude. You know, in Matthew 5 and verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, there's an expectation that not only by our teaching, but also by our action, we help people, we draw people to Christ like a magnet. It's been shown that the Bible teaches that the church is a body of people who have been called out of darkness and into the marvelous light of Christ. Peter talked about that in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. It's a spiritual body housing all the saved, we saw in Acts 2 and verse 47. The church of which the Bible speaks can be positively identified. You know, its unique marks and doctrinal features are distinct, being plainly set forth in the New Testament. You know, Paul said that we've been reconciled both unto God and in one body, Ephesians 2 and verse 16. I call your attention to the one body. God only needed one church. He knew that all men could be saved in that one church. It shouldn't surprise us that the Scriptures teach that the Lord built only one church and wants all men to be added to it, Matthew 16, 18. Paul states that we've been reconciled both unto God in one body. And so as the church is the body, it is the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 And all those who've been obedient to the gospel of Christ have been added to it. Now, back to the question. Are there saved people in other churches? Well, I would have to call, ask you what you mean by other. We've already shown that the Bible says that the Lord built His church. So if it's any church other than the Lord's church, that answer has already been stated. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father by me. Jesus has only one church, and we need to make sure that we're part of it. Well, who will Jesus save? Well, at first let me let, call your attention to Colossians 1 and verse 18, and He is the head of the body, 
the church. So the body is the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in all things he may have the preeminence. Normally we look at Ephesians 5, the end of that chapter, talking about the relationship between the husband and the wife, but there is a nugget an important principle that is contained there in Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church and he is the savior of the body. What is the body? The church. When Christ comes again, who's he coming to save? The church. Now that's, does that ca- cause... Goosebumps to pop up on you to make the hair on the back of your neck stand up? It is so important that we be part of Christ's church. It's eternally important that we be part of Christ's church. If we're not part of Christ's church, what's going to happen to us when Christ comes again? We're going to be lost. It can be any more important than that. You know, the Godhead plan for the uniqueness of the church. In Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, there's a, a listing of ones. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now when you analyze that series of seven ones, what you find is three of those, the Spirit, the Lord, and God the Father, all are referring to the Godhead. We studied about the Trinity in one of your questions. So here we've got the Godhead. They're united in talking about the other parts, the one body, the one hope of your calling, the one faith, the one baptism. What they're talking about there is the one church. The Godhead is united in advocating one church. We should be diligent in our study and our obedience to God's Word. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. When are we going to have an opportunity to present ourselves? Well, ultimately on Judgment Day. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what does all this mean? There is... Victory in Jesus. Jesus adds us to His church when we follow His instructions for salvation. Acts 2.47 Jesus can remove us from His church if we are unfaithful and will not repent. Revelation 2.5 and 3.16 The words Jesus spoke will be the standard for our judgment. John 12.48 Jesus will be the judge making the decision on Judgment Day about my eternal destiny and everyone else's eternal destiny. It's not up to Jim to say who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. God's Word defines that. There is victory in Jesus. We need to show our love for Him by obeying His commandments. We need to be wise by obeying His teaching. We need to abide in Christ by continually following His commandments. We need to be Jesus' friend by obeying His commandments. There is a precious promise that we find in 1 John 5 and verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. I call your attention to that phrase, that you may know that you have eternal life. So if we will go back to the Bible and become a Christian the way people did in the Bible, if we'll go back to the Bible 
and worship God as people did in the Bible. If we'll go back to the Bible and live righteously as we're instructed to do in the Bible, if we will be a servant to others, as Jesus gave us the example of in the Bible, we can have confidence that we're going to heaven. And we need to share this same message with as many other people as we possibly can. We can be victorious through Jesus. Thank you very much.